Hello world of Facebook, we are live yet again. Um, this is week 12 of our Sunday Q&A and yeah, we have some people on already, that's great. Great to see you. Um, hope you're having a lovely day. I'm absolutely roasting. It's, uh, it's been an unbelievably sunny day, un unbelievably hot day. And uh, I've been playing today, had a little gig this afternoon, which was fantastic. It was really great <coughs> to, uh, to play with other human beings. It was uh, a rare treat in this day and age, in these uncertain times, to actually play with other musicians. But I had a great, uh, had a great afternoon playing in Latham Hall, I think, or Latham, somewhere in Latham, a, nice, a lovely uh, uh, venue in Latham. Uh, open air, I think, of course. The, uh, Indoor venues are not open as yet, so regular performances are not kind of happening. But you know, if you can find them, you know, good luck if you can find them. There are the, the occasional kind of outdoor, you know, um, particularly in this weather. You know, we can enjoy the weather and we can get to play some music. And I found the audiences are uh, really appreciative. I think they're starved for music at the moment. So the only thing that I could say from the perspective of optimism is sometimes. People don't realise what they've got until it's not there, and uh, so live music's not been around. And just my experience of, of audiences at the moment, the, you know, the few that I've managed to play for from three, I think, gigs in lockdown, uh, is that they're they're just thrilled to uh, to just experience live music again. So let's hope when things finally begin to start sort of cranking into action, that we have a kind of a uh, uh, you know, a little golden period of uh, uh, you know productivity and, and of uh, you know like a, a time when there's lots of gigs and people are you know, actively striving to hear live music. But anyway, we digress. But I just thought I'd share that with you. Uh, so other good news this week, uh, I wanted to share with the Q and A gang, you guys that, that have been watching this every week. As you may be aware. Uh, one of the reasons why I started this is a bit of a thank you after coming through COVID and spending some time in hospital, which, you know, I won't kind of lie to you, sucked. It was absolutely horrible. Um, and then from that point to this, I think I've been out now, must be over three months, obviously, because we're in week 12 of doing this. So probably approaching four months and I had the kind of follow up call from the hospital to say uh, we need to do an X-ray and see what kind of damage, if any, this uh, this is this is made or has left. You know, if you've got any residual problems, and I got the great news this week that everything's fine, um, which was a massive, massive relief to say the least. Um, and I feel great, but fortunately, you can't see inside yourself, can you? So, whereas the X-ray can, and the, uh, the the results that came back were really positive. So, so uh, I'm thrilled, and uh, thank you to everybody. Who sent me like great, you know, lovely well wishes both when I was in hospital and when I wasn't, you know, and, and even like people who've who've commented, which is really kind of you to say, you know, great to see you looking so well, you know, doing these things and so on. So this is in a way, it's kind of like, you know, I know it's kind of a shallow gesture really in, in the big scheme of things, but this is like my attempt to uh, to sort of uh, say thank you to everybody for for sticking by me. So you know. Uh, I've got your back covered, I'll stick by you too. So so that's good news. Uh, I hope you've had some good news, you know, things are working out for you too. Um, it's tough times, you know. Uh, we're getting to the point now where boredom setting in as well. And, and uh, you know, I was speaking to some musicians today who I played with, and, you know, I hope they won't mind me saying this, but the mood amongst them is, was pretty low, you know. Um, you know, kind of finding it difficult to get the inspiration to keep practicing when there's nothing to sort of practice for or very, very few things to practice for. So I suppose all you can do in these scenarios is take stock for the future and put some plans in place for what you might want to do and be ready to strike when the, you know, uh, when the opportunity arises, like when the gigs start coming or, or, you know, what I'm doing is I'm using this time to write new material and record new material. Cause I know as soon as the, uh, things return back to you know inverted commas normal whatever that might be that uh, I'll be back to being busy again and when you're really busy all the time sometimes you don't have that opportunity to sit there and peruse like what you're going to do for the B section of a tune because you've got a lot of other stuff to do so I'm trying to use that time um, to get things done that take time and you know you really need to kind of uh, 
like, I think dedicate time to things like composition. Certainly I do anyway. For me, it doesn't come easy. It doesn't just, uh, these things don't just come out fully formed most of the time. I have to work at them, yeah. So that then, when it's time to actually p play and gig and, and so on, I've actually got some new music out there, like as if it's sort of come out from there. Sort of as if from nowhere type of thing. Rather than waiting and then, because you know, the thing that will happen once gigs start happening again, you're not going to have a full diary immediately, I wouldn't have thought. What's going to happen is, uh, for, for performance anyway, you know, things are going to, uh, they're going to take a little while to get in place. And if you've done stuff like you've got the material in place, you've got new, new music to play, uh, you've got it all together, you know, you've got charts written, you've got parts for all the players, whatever, then you're going to be that much quicker to actually get it off the ground. When things actually start to happen again so so anyway that's kind of a, just a, a few you know thoughts as to you know trying to keep focus i guess throughout this difficult time um i'm by no means professing to be an expert in this by the way i'm just sharing uh, the uh my approach to it really and trying to keep sort of a trying to keep an optimistic outlook on things when you know let's be honest it's not that difficult to be persuaded to see things the other way around at the moment is it not uh, so you know any kind of way of looking at things with uh, with a slightly you know glass half full you know philosophy or whatever I think is to be welcomed. So uh, yeah, let's hear your good news stories if you got any. You know please share them below. Uh, likewise, any you know any comments, suggestions, uh, questions of course, please you know stick them in the the, uh, the boxes underneath this. Uh, if you're watching this on Facebook, brilliant, um, amazing. You know, put them in the Facebook uh, you know, comments if, uh, if, or send me a message if you prefer. If you'd rather your comments not be visible to all, then sure, send me a personal message via Messenger. Uh, alternatively, if you're looking at this in YouTube, I'm pretty easy to find. You can either leave a comment on YouTube or just send one to my email address, john at johnweetcroftguitar.com. That's the one. Uh, and I look at it, you know. So this week, uh, this is a case in point, you know, I have three fantastic requests uh, from three different players uh, one of which wants me to look at transformational chords you know knowing how to play like so from a kind of shall we say basic you know entry shall we say um, you know, beginning to play jazz that kind of thing like how you kind of can develop the chord vocabulary but I'm going to show you three stages to this you know kind of a, a basic and then an intermediate and then a more advanced way of looking at it uh, just looking at seventh chords basically uh, then I'm going to look at these things called the Coltrane changes. My mate Wayne sent me sent me a, a quite a long uh, book. Great, you know, I welcome those things. A long message with two or three topics, or maybe three or four. We looked at one last week. We looked at the melodic minor scale with all the pentatonic options, or, or some of them at least. Uh, and then he also mentioned about these things called the Coltrane changes, which is a particular type of substitute um, move that the players will sometimes insert into arrangements uh, and Coltrane wrote a whole bunch of tunes based on them um, so we're going to kind of unpick them and then the third topic today is some Django chords um, some gypsy jazz shapes I'm not going to get too much into things like La Pompe which is the you know the rhythm that the players often talk about uh, or you know chord se you know, sequences that you hear Christophs and all that kind of stuff um, which a Christoph is kind of a, a, a slang term for a specific set of chords that happens all the time in this, you know, a bit like a turnaround or 251 or whatever, you know. But maybe, you know, we've got all the time in the world, you know, lockdown shows no signs of, uh, of, um, of ending anytime soon, so I'm going to keep these going. So I don't need to exhaust every idea to its extreme every week, you know, I want to try and keep some stuff. Uh, not that I'm withholding information, but I want to try and keep some stuff so that we've got things to talk about next week and the week after and the week after and the week after. So I'm just going to look at some chord shapes today, the actual shapes. So I'm not too concerned about it sounding super authentic, so I'm probably going to play it on this guitar rather than playing it on a, a Salma style thing. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, there'll be something in this for everyone, even if these are things you've looked at before. Bear with me, I might have some new angle perhaps you know or the, you may see something in a slightly different way the number of times that i look at information that i think i've got down when some other players talking about something you know major triads or something and they've come up with a cool new way of approaching it that i've not spotted before it just happens all the time in fact i even do it to myself i mean one of the things i'm going to share with, with you today is something that occurred to me only in the last couple of weeks you know and i'm familiar with these topics and i've lived with them for decades some of them but i saw a connection between 
this voice and then that voice and that I'd never seen before and it just made the memorization of certain shapes that much clearer for me you know and sometimes you know it comes when it comes you know these things happen when they happen and you trying to force them is not going to work you know anyway as usual we began with a piece of music helped me in the last few weeks uh, so I'm going to play a solo a little solo piece only a minute or two well minute, it's probably just under two minutes long depends upon how fast I play um, which is going to be the opening track from this album that I'm recording in lockdown so this is just a little solo piece. Uh, I can even talk about this perhaps uh, once we've got it, once I've played it, maybe I'll talk a little bit about it. And if you're interested, if these things, you know, if a bell goes off and you think, okay, maybe I would be interested in learning about that stuff, then just let me know and I'll expand upon these things in future weeks. Okay, enough talk. So this is called Unclaimed Treasures. <laughs> like that short and sweet I know but it sets the stall for the piece that follows which uh, is kind of a E major Phrygian dominant thing and with these interesting chords <laughs> worth that time do you um, so that might be an interesting chord major seven with a raised nine comes from the sixth degree of a harmonic minor so starts off in A minor Seven. Sorry, an E7. But I'd also get an F major 7. With a sharp 9. Sharp 11 as well, if you want. Kind of a little bit like a polychord where you have a, an E and an F. All happening at once. Those two things sound at the same time. And what that sets up for me is, is the kind of an E groove, right? kind of interesting harmonic minor thing happening where in harmonic minor you know the flamenco that move you've got an E in A harmonic minor this is of course you've got an E and an F and an F so what you can do you can switch the bass notes around so I could play the E with the F in the bass and that's this that kind of thing but I can also play the F with the E in the bass motion in the bass and you can exploit that in lots of different ways it's something that we can look at in coming weeks perhaps so where the sort of bass note went down and the chords went up so anyway i hope you like that tune it's based on a, a kind of an unusual chord so this thing at the start that's an e major seven sus four and that's kind of where the basis of this tune came from e major seven sus four and then D, major 7 is 4 over A and so on. 
So that type of chord voicing, it's not sort of a super common one, so sort of ask yourself how many major sevens or four voicings you're familiar with. Um, I found it's one of those voicings that works better in different registers, so meaning it depends where you put the four. So in this case, when it's kind of sounding a bit like a bass note, it sounds like really that's functioning as the bass note. It's a bit more successful than if you have the same exact chord with, with, with the four there, doing that, where it sounds more tense with the tritone. And, you know, this, so so sometimes you have to be careful with voicings as to how you put the notes together. So for example, a voice in like uh, E major seven with a nine on the top, that's a common voice that we often play. Uh, it's got no five in it, that chord. So really what that is, it's these four notes. All played together. Now if you play all four of those notes together, I can't physically even do it to be fair, but if you did on the piano, it would sound terrible. You know? So what happens is we play those four notes by octaves so that is it but it's put into different octaves to uh, to keep them a distance apart from one another and this idea of moving notes into different octaves to keep them away from one another so that they have room to kind of sound by themselves is one of the basic principles of voicing chords on the guitar so sort of neatly links into this first topic what I wanted to look at. And I'm going to call this like transformational harmony. But that can be the title for this. Uh, and it's a simple topic. Uh, this is not, this is like hopefully not going to be uh, like a, you know, too brain heavy, uh, this one. Um, what it relies upon is you can't really play completely by shape, right? What you have to do is you have to, when playing chords on the guitar, if you really want to know what you're doing and you really want to be as flexible as you possibly can, it's helpful if you're aware of what the intervals are in each of the chords that you play. So for example, if I play C major seven here, and a common one of the first C major seven chords you probably might learn on the guitar. Uh, now, there's a number of ways of figuring this out. One is just as a shape, you know, like third fret, fifth fret, fourth fret, fifth fret. The problem with that is, it's not really flexible. It's a bit like learning a phrase from a phrase book in a foreign language, but you don't know what each of the words means. If that's the case and you have to adjust it, you know, you go into a you know, French shop or whatever and order a coffee and they, they say, do you want a white coffee or a black coffee? And you, you I don't know what I even asked, you know, uh, or they kind of query you on the sentence that you just said, you're going to be kind of a bit stuck. And unless they answer you back with exactly the same phrases that you know, then you're in trouble, you know? Uh, so likewise, if all you know are shapes, then it's fine if you're only going to, ever going to play those shapes, but if you're ever going to play something that, that requires a modification to that shape, you're in trouble. So, for example, if I know that's C major 7, but the tune that I'm playing requires me to play C major 7, sharp 5 to C major 7 with 6, with a sharp 5 to a C major 7, to a C major 7 with a flat 5, hold up, sharp 11. If I don't know which of those notes is, is the note that I want, then I'm in trouble. But if I do, then I can do exactly what I just did then. So, so you can either know this in well, many different ways. One of them is intervals. So that's the way I think about these things mainly. Root, fifth, that's the seventh, and that's the third. So this voicing for me is a root, five, seven, three voicing. That's what that is. Root, five, seven, three. Root, root five, seven, three. Now, the beauty of knowing it as a root, five, seven, three, and this is kind of like for the, the uh, you guys that are sort of new to this type of stuff, is that everything can be moved except this one. Of course, that can be moved, but then it becomes a new chord. But in the world of C, in sort of C-ness, right, that note isn't going to get moved in this instance. Of course, we can then play voicings that like the, play, play the same notes that have the the, the four notes that I just played spread out so that it's not necessarily the root and the bottom but that's going to be a different voicing right and that's maybe a topic for another day you know drop two voicings is what i just played there everywhere you know i think from pretty much the lowest one that you could play and you want to make sure that you can go from the lowest one through all the various permutations that's about the, that's about the highest one i can reach on this guitar can i not maybe not. okay so 
Again, that's a topic for another day. But for now, just this voice in. One, five, seven, three. Of course, we could say C, G, B, E, if you, if you prefer. The beauty of it being one, five, seven, three is it's still one, five, seven, three. It's still one, five, seven, three. It's still one, five, seven, three. If I move it through different keys, whereas if I go C, G, B, E, and then I move to B, it's moved. It's D, A, C sharp, F sharp, and then so that the actual uh, absolute value of the notes will change, but the intervals will not change. So you know, there's a value in both. You know, you maybe be able to do one quicker than the other. Uh, I've found with playing upright bass, which is just there. I've been practicing that a lot recently. It's making me think much more about the actual notes themselves rather than. Sometimes on guitar, I just think intervals so that it's instantly transposable. I'm having to really think, you know, because the limited range and the fact that you generally play close to the open position means that you might have to flip something mid-flow. So rather than playing an arpeggio that just keeps going across the guitar, so you have to jump to a lower note just so that you keep it within the actual range of the instrument. Again, we digress. Okay, so, so the first thing to do is take this through all the pair mutations, and you can do this in a physical level, meaning string by string or interval by interval. So we could go this C major seven. So let's just deal with the five for now, which is this one. So that could become C major seven sharp five. We could replace the five or the sharp five with a six. Go sharp five, and then sharp five. Uh, so regular five going to flat five. Sometimes referred to as uh, raised four would be more appropriate. So it's not necessarily replacing the five, we're just choosing it instead of. We can always add the five, in fact, you can put the five on the top there if you wish. But. Okay, so that's C major, C major sharp five, C major, C major sharp four. Or, no, but when I say C major, it's always C major seven, by the way. Okay, just to stop the chord symbols up being a massive mouthful. Major means major seven. Yeah. Okay, so that we can do that with the five. Okay, we could uh, move the seven and go C major seven, C dominant seven, in C six, yeah. C seven, C major seven, C seven, C seven flat five. <laughs> you get it, yeah. C7 regular 5, C7 sharp 5. See where we're going with this? So, all these different permutations, what was that about? Eight or nine different chords there, just from one voice in. And they're all 1, 5, 7, 3, albeit with the caveat that in some instances, if you keep going, 7, flat 7, becomes a 6. But still, you know. You, you, hopefully you, you get the idea by now, you know, but, uh, we have to be uh, intelligent enough to know that if you move it far enough, it becomes a different interval. Okay, so there we've got major seven, major seven sharp five, major seven, major seven flat five, all from the same voicing. Okay, let me just stop you there for a second as well. Any four note voicing can be moved to different string groupings. So whatever I find here, Same thing, root five, seven, three, and guess what? We can go base seven, sharp five, base seven, flat five, base eleven, whatever you want to call it, eight to seven, dominant seven, six, dominant seven, dominant seven, flat five, bam, and it goes. So anything that I do here can be dragged to here. You've got to then use your ear and go on whatever guitar you're playing and what register it's in, what range it's in, if it's too low or whatever. But still, it's an available voice in. C major 7, C major 7 sharp 5, C major 7 with a 13. Or the tricky one, but. C major 7 with a flat 5. So, this is how you go about expanding your chord vocabulary. Let's just keep going, we'll go through. These aren't all the available options, but it's many of them. So we've dealt with the dominant seven, we'll go back to C major seven again, low the third, that's what's happening on the, the second string. So now C major seven, C minor major seven. Follow? C 
C minus 7. C minus 6. C minus seven. C minus seven. Raise five, pops. Flat thirteen. Whatever you call it. C minus seven. Circle inversion of a major chord. Then. C minus seven flat five. Went with that one. C minus seven flat five with a second on the top. That's a nine on the top. C minus seven with a second on the top, and that's kind of a sus two. C minus 7 flat 5, and then we flatten the 7 again. So maybe 7. And then all 1, 5, 7, 3 chord voices. So every one of those, the, every move that I just did here, major, minor, major, minor, minor flat 5, diminished, I could do here. Major, minor, major, minor, half diminished. I could do it here. Major, minor, major, um, minus seven, minus seven flat five, full diminished. So you see how this is how you kind of uh, exponentially expand upon your chord voice and notes. Excuse me, sorry, I'm aware of the fact this is going to happen today because it's roasting hot in this room. It's like a sauna. And so my guitar is going to move. That was the gig today where I didn't use this guitar for two, three, five. Man, it's like, I think the guitar got baked. It absolutely got roasted. Um, so it's tuning up mid-song. Okay, so, uh, hence the title as well. It's really hot. So, so far, so good. I'm hoping that's, that's making sense and that's giving you some information. So that would be something I would say for, like, if you're kind of new to this stuff, I'd make sure that you've got all your options. Get your ducks in a row, you know, so you can take this voice in that's major and you can make it dominant or minor or half diminished or full diminished. And then you can take your major and make it major flat five or major sharp five. And you take the dominant and you can make it with a flat five or with a sharp five. Or, you know, and on it goes, yeah. Okay. Now, for more of an intermediate student, like someone who's, who's kind of got that together, where this can be quite cool is you can use them then to harmonize scales. So effectively, if I'm harmonizing, say, C major, we'll keep it simple to begin with. If I take this voice in and I move every note up one note of the scale so that E becomes an F so that B becomes a C so that G becomes an A and the C becomes a D or if you prefer the 3 becomes the 4 the 7 becomes the root so on and so forth what you get is C major D minor 7 still the same voice in though still 1, 5, 7, 3 D minor 1, 5, 7, 3 you get E minor, 1, 5, 7, 3, then you get F major, 1, 5, 7, 3, then you get G major with a dominant 7th, 1, 5, 7, 3, you get A minor, and then you get B half finished. So you see. Harmonizing uh, chord scales, and of course you can do the same thing. So you can move these things around to different string groups. Ran out of space, but this, this makes sense. So all of those voices, they were the same voice, and I actually think they're all the same voice, and I think that the type of chord, that's easy enough. That's what we looked at last time we, we were saying we can have a pentatonic that goes one, three, four, five, seven. But which type of three, which type of four, which type of seven? You know, who says it has to be a minor third? Why couldn't it be a major third? So likewise, this voice in, 1, 5, 7, 3. Which type of 1, 5, 7, 3? Well, in this case, it's a major. In this case, it's a minor. In this case, it's a minor. Then it's another major. Then it's a dominant. Then it's a minor. Then it's a half diminished. And then it's a major. Okay. So far, so good, I'm hoping. Okay. Then you can do this with other scales. So say you know your melodic minor scale. If you don't, now's the time to learn it. Minor major seven, that's what you get from the root. We know that one, don't we? Because we took the major seven, we lowered the minor third to make it minor. That's how you find the voicing for it. Then the next chord, minor seven. Then off the minor third, you get major seven with a sharp five. We dealt with that one as well, yeah? That's one of our 
So, you know, if you're scratching your head going, how do you play major seven sharp five? Well, you tell me. You've got the information available to you now to do that. So we have minor major, minor, major sharp five, then two dominant chords, which is quite cool. And two half diminished. So then we're back to our minor major. And the same deal again. We can do that on every string group, you know, we don't have to. For everyone. Okay, so we, for the purposes of this discussion, we just do this on string groups five through to two. Okay, so we've got C major, we do C major and then C melodic minor. So C major scale goes C, D minor, E minor, two, three, four, F major, two, three, four, G seven, A minor, B half diminished, C major. C melodic minor goes C minor major seven D minor E flat major seven sharp five F seven G seven A half diminished B half diminished for now C minor major seven. Sorry, my intonation is terribly out. I need new strings on this guitar. Excuses, excuses today, eh? Wow, there you go. So I'm hoping at this point this is making some kind of sense and if more advanced students can do this on string groups four to one and string groups six to three, I guess, yeah, do it there as well. Of course, you can do this with the other voicings and just using one voicing to begin with. So at that stage, you might want to tap out of this and think okay, that's enough, you know. Uh, but if you know your harmonic minor scale, you know what's stopping you going minor major seven, half the minute, major sharp five minor dominant seven major seven diminished and minor major and if you know your harmonic major you can go C major then you can go D half diminished then you go E minor or E seven F minor major so on E seven uh, G seven and then A flat major seven sharp five and then B diminished C major 7. So depend upon, you know, whatever scale you want to plug into this system, you can do it with all of them. So there I did it with, what did I do? I did uh, major scale, consequently all the modes. I did uh, melodic minor scale, and then I think I did harmonic minor and harmonic major. Uh, so, you know, rewind this back if you're watching this on YouTube, pause it there, uh, you know, write that down. And if you've got a question, what's the harmonic major scale, then stick it underneath. And I'll answer that one. If you're interested in this, you know, how do you know what those chords are? It's a reasonable question. Maybe it's beyond the scope of what we've got time for right now. <clears throat> okay, so that's, uh, I said three things with this, didn't I? So that's the second thing. Okay, so I'm going to go back to C major for a moment. Slightly out of tune, C major. I apologize. I promise I'll have new strings on for next week. I've just eaten them alive. Just to, with the weather this week, I just feel like as if... Uh, Maybe I've got caustic sweat or something at the moment. It's just absolutely killing guitar strings. Um, okay, so this is where we're at. So I'm going to show you how to transform this into something that's also very cool. So this would work as C major, but it would also these would work as voicings you could use if you were comping over, say. Of a D minor, say. Now, a really popular thing to do uh, with comp and chords in the, these kind of scenarios is to use a thing called quartal voicings. So you think, oh no, more stuff to learn, you know, voicings based on fourths. I think we've touched upon this, so the fourth intervals being... Uh, that kind of thing. Okay. So let me show you how you can find them from these other voicings. So if you've got this together, and you've got this together, Now we said before this was a voice that goes one, five, seven, three. That's what we said, yeah? One, five, seven, three. All we need to do to make it into a quartal voice in is take the five and replace it with a four. That's it. That's all you need to do. Okay. So then instead of having one, five, seven, three, we have one, four, seven, three. And that's a beautiful voice in based on 
fourths. on the D string in this instance and move it back one scale tone. those things so you play cool yeah okay and of course the same thing works on the top strings as well so if you've learnt your major seven chords you see major seven drop the five to the four C half diminished, up the five to the four. A minor, up the five to the four. G seven, up the five to the four. F major, up the five to the four. E minor, up the five to the four. D minor, up the five to the four. Super cool, yeah. Okay, I'm going to check my tune and I'm going to show you the next uh, Sorry about this, can't be out. I need aircon, that's what I need. Or a ludicrous string deal, if anyone's listening. Preferably if you want to come around and put them on for me as well, be great. Okay, alright. Alright, so, so that's a major scale, yeah? So we also did this, didn't we? Melodic minor will do. So C, we can do harmonic minor if you want, uh, or harmonic major. It's all as easy. They're all as easy as one another, assuming you know how to do this. All right. So C minor major seven. Okay, with five. No, put the four in. That's the quarter voice in. So it's like C minor major seven sus four, or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Next chord. D minor with a four in there. So I'll have two voices on. Next chord is E flat major 7 sharp 5. So we take the sharp 5 and we put a sharp 4 in, that's what you get in that scale. We're beginning to build up a quartal voice in for melodic minor. F7, take the 5, put the sharp 4 in. Ooh, there you go. Sounds pretty cool to me. Seven, it's regular four this time. A minor half diminished with a regular four. Now check this bad boy out, right? B minor seven flat five with a flattened four. Ooh. Ah, now you might recognize that chord. B seven raised nine, yeah? which is actually quartal in melodic minor, it's a quarter voice in because this, believe it or not, is not a major third, not from that scale, because the scale goes one, two, three, four. And that's why that seventh mode of melodic minor scale generally is not used against minor seven flat five chords, it's because it's got this buried in there. So the whole scale, the whole B altered scale if you want it to be, in quartal chords, Voicings could be used against, say, B7 if it's being used in a functional situation. Not only can you play them here, but you can play them here, and you can. 
and play, yeah? Yeah. I'll just let that sink in for a minute, because that's quite a lot of information. But, well, hopefully you can see that you're getting to it from simple means. So we started off, just to recap quickly, we started off by looking at these voice synths as 1573. I think that's what we called them, 1573. And we saw how they could be adjusted to create all these different types of chords. Major sharp five, major flat five, dominant seven, dominant seven flat five, dominant seven bass five, six, and minor seven, minor seven bass five, minor seven flat five, and minor major seven, minor six, on it goes, you know, like full diminished, whatever, man, whatever. Okay, so we'll add to that. If you take the five and you substitute it with a four, you get a quartal voice in, and you can move that through the scale. That allows you to harmonize the scale in, in quartal chords. And they can all be used to substitute chords against things that belong in that scale. Like, for example, if I play you know, C minor major 7, well, I could play that over an F7 chord. That's an interesting chord with the major 7 on the top. I'll talk about that one at one point. I played a tune called Circles a few months ago now, and that's got that. Made dominant seven with a major seven in the melody over the top, but I, I digress. Okay, so dominant seven, F seven, what could I play for F seven? This. All of them, right? They could all be played against F seven. Right, so this gives you some room to manoeuvre when you're playing over things like, you know, non-functioning, non-diatonic chords, uh, or when you're playing in a static situation, or when you're playing things that are two five ones and so on. So I think I'm gonna park that here for now because we could go on about that for the, for the rest of the hour, uh, and I promise to look at some other things. So, so I'm hoping that that's, that's a useful uh, little section there and you can revisit this. I know I move through these things quite quickly, I apologize for that, but it's the nature of trying to get so much stuff in, I guess. So that's my first subject then, transformational harmony, we'll call it. Okay, so uh, again, you know, please leave some comments, questions, you know, anything supportive. It's nice to see nice things, it's cool. Uh, right, next thing then we're going to look at, is where Wayne was asking about, is just a, just a way of introducing like a simple way of looking at the, what some people call the Coltrane changes. So the first thing would be, let's establish what they are. Okay, so John Coltrane uh, wrote a bunch of tunes that exploited symmetry in terms of the way the harmony moves. Now that's in itself nothing new. There are numerous examples of tunes that move in a certain way. So for example, tunes like Erigen by, uh, yeah, Sonny Rollins I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure Google will tell me the answer later on. Yeah, I'm sure it's a Sonny Rollins tune. Where he's got two fives moving in semitones. Or a tune like Tune Up. tones um, or B section into Cherokee which moves in tones or How High the Moon and Ornithology which moves in tones and so on. Uh, now Coltrane was quite into two particular moves which he used. Uh, one of them was to do with two five ones or five ones or just ones that moved in major thirds and you hear that in the tune Giant Steps countdown and, and all those different variations on, on, on that. Uh, so essentially an augmented triad in terms of the key signatures. So if you were in C, uh, that would give us C as a key, then maybe a major third down, we'll go down for now, A flat, and then a major third down could be E to C. So we find some way to make music out of something that goes from the key C, Key of A flat to the key of E, back to C again. Okay. Uh, so you hear that one, uh, Giant Steps Countdown. You hear minor thirds being exploited in tunes like Central Park West. Similar kind of idea. So just for comparison, I know it's in B, as is Giant Steps. Or it starts in B. Giant Steps are probably but more likely not in B actually, but because um, it sort of resolves, doesn't resolve to the B chord, it resolves to the E flat chord, so 
I would be tempted to say that it's actually an E flat, but but that's uh, you know it doesn't really matter, right? It could be any of them. Uh, so Central Park West uh, moves to minor third harmony. So if we were in C, the four keys now, because remember you've got four minor thirds, not three, will be C, and then a minor third lower would be A, and then you'd have F sharp and G flat, and then you'd have E flat here. So he used that as a compositional model moving through those different keys. And they're not necessarily that related in terms of, you know, there's no one scale that will fit all the four chords uh, other than you know, the chromatic scale. So. so what happens in the Coltrane changes, the ones that people use for substitutes, uh, is we go through that first cycle of major thirds and we place it within the same time frame as you'd normally find a 2 5 one. Like the long version of a 2 5 one. So if I'm in the key of C major, I may go D minor, G7, 3, 4, and C major 7. 2, 3, 4, D minor, G7. <laughs> I know there's a, there's a string on a break or something. Ah, oh, forgive me. Hopefully the information is better than the sound of this flipping guitar branch. Yeah. Um, it yet, generally speaking, never goes out of tune. It's the weather and the, and the fact that the strings have been off for a few weeks. Uh, lockdown. That's what it is. If I was gigging all the time with this guitar, it'd be getting changed more frequently. Shame on me, I know. Um, okay, so the cold strain changes. What we do is we fit a little move that goes through around the houses, goes through those chords and around the houses. and takes us back to where we want to be kind of in the same place, albeit a bar later. So we've got D minor, two, three, four, G7, and then C major for two bars, generally speaking. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna clip that down to make that just one bar, okay? So how are we gonna get there is we're gonna go D minor, and then before we leave bar one, we start our move by going to the second of those tonalities. So D minor belongs in C. Then we go to A flat, but we don't go straight there, we go via its five chord. So we go D minor, E flat, A flat. So that's the start of our two. One, two, three, four, one, two. And then in the middle of that bar, we go to the next key, the third key, which is E. We go B7, which is the five of E. E, G7, and now we're coming up to bar four. C major, two, three. So instead of going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, we go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, bar four, two, three, four. Okay. So then the changes that we're talking about here. And they can be used as a substitute on the very art and the compositional basis. Uh, whenever you see a long 251, it's going to fit in there. Uh, but then of course if that's happening in the harmony, we want to find some ways to play against it. You know, usually it's faster. Okay, but we're gonna, as I say, because this is kind of an introduction, we're not so concerned about the speed here, right? So I've recorded a little backing track that's very slow. Uh, so the first thing to do is make sure you can play those three scales. Okay. So again, four systems here. I'm going to give you four different levels of attacking this. First one is going to be scale. So pick an area of the fretboard here, say, can you play C scale? In the same area, can you play A flat? And in the same place, can you play E? So if you can do that, you kind of reasonably, you've got a fighting chance of being able to make this happen, right? So, although we want to articulate the chords, but you know, let's just start where we start and we'll take it where it goes. So, so first off, I'm going to give you like a really super slow version of the Coltrane changes. In fact, there's a bar of each: two, three, four, E flat, A flat major, B seven, the five of E, E major. G7, C. So it's like painfully slow, but 
So we, what we do is we start with C major scale, A flat scale, E scale, C scale. Sense for the C scale, A flat scale, E scale, C. So that's just playing the scale when the chords change. Now, what you find is when you play it, that's not so bad because you've got a bar on each chord. When you play at the double time one, because you start ramping the tempo up, what's tricky is it changes key mid bar, it goes change, change, change. So maybe it's helpful to think of this in 2 4, 1, 2, next bar, next bar, rather than thinking of it in 4 4, because you very often we're not used to changing mid bar, so that would be the key of C. A flat, E, you make it sense. So there, I was trying to keep it really simple, and I was just playing scale. I'm sorry if it, if this phrasing, but I can't help it. You know, uh, it's it's. Probably more difficult for me to just play the scale, if I'm being honest. I, um, that's a good exercise. Can you keep, keep the scale going? That's cool, that's really nice, and that's something, I have practiced those kind of things, I've just forgotten about it. So there, I kept the scale going as a scale, and then as the, the tonality changed, I just moved to the new scale, but I didn't stop. Uh, that's a skill in, in and of itself. I kind of touched upon it, I think, last week or two weeks ago, looking at A major a major pentatonic going to A minor, we're keeping the pattern going. It's a little bit trickier there, but but you know, it's the same kind of thing. So that's, that's the scale thing, so that might be the first thing to do. Uh, so then the second thing would be maybe to work on the arpeggios so that you can play the arpeggios. Uh, particularly if you're playing in eighth notes, you know, one, two, three, four, or one and two band, you've got four notes uh, for each chord that it's changing midway through the bar. So again, I'll go back to the slow one, you know, and make sure that you've got this sorted. And again, you know, connect them however you wish. You know. I mean, it's, it's not such a bad idea to just do this first. Just make sure you've got this covered. You know. But away from the bass, don't make it sound like a bass line. And then maybe the root third of each chord, you know, go in any direction you want, you know. And so on, yeah. Uh, or we can play more uh, complete arpeggios. So maybe without the chords, you know, D minor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, again, you know, th this is an exercise with no musical kind of.
and kind of play around with them, all the different directions, up and down, or whatever. Uh, Jerry Bagons, he's good with all that stuff, so you know, he knows about taking arpeggios and putting them through all the different permutations. So if it's a C major arpeggio, so it'd be in one, three, five, seven, it could be one, three, seven, five, one, five, three, seven, and so on, you know, one, seven, three, five. Or you could displace, instead of going one, three, five, seven, I could go one, three, five, seven. start that on different points uh, so you can go crazy with those things uh, the third one is this thing that players went mad about when they hear giant steps I think this thing that they often call it the Coltrane pattern or Coltrane pentatonic or something uh, some players also call tetrachords it just means a four note structure that defines the sound of a chord um, in classical music it means kind of something else four notes within the range of a fifth and you combine them together to create scales but the way that jazz musicians tend to think of them is a four-note pattern that can define the essence of a chord and can be played from different points of a chord. But for now, if we just do things from the root, and we say like a common tetrachord pattern might resemble the first four notes of pentatonic. So it might be for, say, a minor chord, we might go uh, one, three, four, five. So that would be, in that case, D minor. One, three, four, five. And then for E flat, which is the uh, the next chord, we might go one, two, three, five, and then A flat would be one, two, three, five, then B seven, one, two, three, five, then E one, two, three, five, one, two, three, five, one, two, three, five. And you hear that all over giant steps one. Again, the slow one, okay, this is not, not meaning to do this quickly, it's meant to be slow so we can get it. Uh, I should have put a count in, should I? There you go. Bosh. This last thing that I played here, this is going to be theme number four, and this is what we can do, we can minorize the dominant chord, so, and this creates an interesting pattern. There's loads of ways of playing through giant steps and, and those and related tunes, the Coltrane changes, countdown, you know, uh, moments of notice, you know, gazillion other tunes written by other people, you know, Pat Metheny, for example, is someone who uses that change quite a lot, you know, in his compositional um, sort of canon, as it were. Uh, Okay, so what we can do is we can go D minor, that's C, okay. Now, when we play E flat 7, we can imagine that is actually being, there's E flat 9, there's B flat minor 6. So think of that as B flat minor rather than E flat 7, yeah. Django over here. Okay, and then that goes to A flat. And then instead of going to B7, go to F sharp minor, which is the same principle, same relationship, two of five, that goes to B, instead of going to G7, we go to D minor, which goes to C. Because what that's, this gives us now is an interesting little pattern, that if we were to take it from C major, we'll go C, B flat minor, A flat major, G flat or F sharp minor, E major, 
G minor, C. Major, minor, major, minor, major, minor, major. Beautiful. And we can drill the hell out of that, you know, we can kind of work on that one. So, there, one more time. So, imagine it's C for the, the, the D minor. You can play C against D minor. I can go C, B flat, A flat, F sharp, E. So what I was thinking there was D minor, B flat minor, A flat, G flat minor, F sharp or whatever, you know, this is B7, go into E, pick a D minor, go to C. Okay, so hopefully there's some uh, food for thought with uh, the close range changes and we can deal with that in greater depth as we go. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to look at today is a little introduction to the kind of chords you see in gypsy jazz. Now again, just as time, you know, kind of beats us each each week. I'm going to really just give you some uh, just tips here, just to get us started, and we can look at this in greater depth in coming weeks. Okay. So the first thing I want to say is uh, kind of a caveat to this. I don't profess to be uh, any kind of authority on tr trying to play gypsy jazz in a traditional way like kind of um, like as if I'm trying to do something like if I were for argument's sake you know you've got a commission that's a uh, we want it to sound like the quintet of the hot club of France you know playing in a bar or whatever or you know doing a concert you know in, in the 1930s in which case then there's kind of like a, a implicit um, requirement that you do things in the traditional way if you want it to sound right whereas if you play gypsy jazz now as in you know 2020 you can do whatever the hell you like really uh because players uh you know maybe the door was opened by guys like Borelli Legren and then this whole generation of uh, uh young guys like Adrian Moyard and so on who, who are playing gypsy jazz but they're also really just throwing all kinds of modern stuff at it as well so to say, you know, this is how you play gypsy jazz, is a bit like saying, here's how you play rock. Well, what does rock mean? Does, that, does rock mean Greg Howe? Or does it mean Chuck Berry? Because it could mean both, you know. So gypsy jazz could mean like a traditionalist player, you know, someone who really wants it to sound like, you know, acoustic, like, and very much like the way the Django might have sounded in the early 1930s or mid 1930s. But then, you know, Django played different in the, in the late 1940s, in the early 50s, his rhythm playing changed, you know, everything about what he did, and the rhythm players that he chose um, and that he played with, they, they evolved too as the music changed. So there is no one gypsy jazz, it's it's kind of a big thing, you know, uh, and there's plenty of players out there who, 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 uh, who, who've got their own opinions on it, you know, and all I can do is just add mine into the equation and just say, Here's the skills that I think you need to really kind of get started. So one of them is, it's great to know some of the traditional shapes, and if you're interested, the shape to get you started really is that fella, that bad boy there. Right, um, let me get the tune up. So, so some of the, the actual kind of uh, uh, shapes that Django like to play, you have to kind of think about his disability, the fact that you know only having two fingers. That were, that were movable, but he still used the other fingers, meant that certain shapes he would play by positioning parts, the damaged parts of his hand on the fretboard. 
So for example, for a major chord, let's say G6 uh, or G6-9, he might play something like this. So, okay, so let's just deal with some provisos to introduction to gypsy jazz chords. And I'm just going to give you some indisputable things that, that you definitely would benefit from being able to do, right? So maybe I'm going to give you three or four of them. Okay, thing number one, using one finger to play more than one note. That's something that you might want to get to grips with. So if I play this five note chord here, I'm actually only going to use three fingers, right? So that's what I'm after. G6-9. So we, again, yeah, intervals, the fifth, the root, the major third, the sixth, the nine. Well, what's happening is this finger here, the second finger, is actually covering two strings. And it's doing this by fretting in between. You fret in between. And in fact, what you can do with this is bring the thumb across to play the root note. And that's a really common gypsy voice in, if you like. Uh, so if you go to the campsite or you go to Samoa or whatever, you know, how I missed that, you know, this year, you'll see that being used an awful lot, you know, so, and even the, the more, you know, the, the forward thinking players, and Borelli knows that chord voice, and of course he does, you know, but he knows five million others as well, but that doesn't mean to say he doesn't use it when he wants the traditional sound, but he can, of course, use other things when he wants to sound more modern. It's a choice, you can do whatever you want, okay? But that's a good one to get you started. And why that's a nice chord voice in, in this style is because what it does is it leads you to some of the other chord voices. So, for example, a common move will be to go from, say, I just do it without the bass note for a moment. There's the one chord, the five chord could be one, five, one, five, one. It's a really economical move. So in that case there I'm playing a D7, again with the second finger playing two notes. Now of course the third finger is playing a bunch of notes as well, but we're used to that because that's a bar. This isn't really a bar. What it's doing is we're fretting in between the strings and you're catching the strings on either side of it, which is kind of an unusual technique. That's not a common thing in some styles of music, you know. I remember I've shown this to many guitar players, and I'm like, what, you play two strings with one finger? I know there are other guitar players that do it, you know. Um, Mel Travis would famously play an E major chord like that, you know, with two fingers, you know. So to get, to get those two. And so, okay, so those voices, the six, nine, Voices. And then the minor version is often played like this, unless you've got like sort of Herculean hands, in which case then you can do that, which is for me it's, it's way, I can't reach it. But a, a good compromise for mine is those four. So what you have is the five, it's the root, the minor third, and the sixth. Okay. So that voice in that's definitely to try and get onto your fingers if you can. Okay, now, okay, so thing number one. Okay, thing number one, two notes with one finger. Okay, that's something that you hear Django do a lot, you know. Those kind of things. So there's a chord voice in there, there's a D6. I'm playing the A and the D with one finger. That kind of thing. So that's kind of how Django would do it, I guess. Okay, so thing number two is what I'm going to call plurality, right? So what that means is you can see the same chord voice in, in Django Reinhardt style or in Gypsy Jazz, whatever you want to call it, you know, swing, you know, acoustic swing, if you want to call it that. You can see the same chord voice in, used in different contexts with different names, and that can be very confusing at first, because you could look at a chord like this, so these three notes. And these three note voices are very popular in Gypsy Jazz. Although, if you look at you know, the video, the Jaton Dre video, where you see you know, Django playing, you know, his brother's playing rhythm guitar and so on, you see them playing like conventional like majors and minors. They're, they're just using regular, just normal chords, you know. They're not using, you know, uh, quote unquote gypsy jazz voicings. They're just using the regular major and minor chords. I think what's happened is players maybe would play the ones Django favoured because everyone wants to be Django, right? Uh, and then that's become like, you know, it's a bit like when players play tunes from the real book 
with the wrong chords in and the wrong chords become the right chords. I'm not saying that Django's chords are the wrong chords, by the way. It's just, if you want to play minor swing like the way Django played it, then just use a regular minor chord. Don't be playing minor sixes because, of course, we play minor swing, you know, half a dozen times or more. Um, but if you listen to the, particularly the earlier era ones, that, then it's just straight major minor bar chords like what everybody plays, you know. Uh, but Django, of course, would have this twist it. Okay, but you see these three note voice ins a lot of the time. So things like this. So you might say, what's this voice in? And you might be thinking, A6. Yeah, and you'd be right. Maybe. Maybe. It depends on context. Because right? this chord voice in could be many things. I'll give you three different interpretations of that voice in. It could be A6, so say I was playing a 2 5 one. B minor, B7, A6. B minor, A7, uh, E7, A6. Okay, here's another quick version. E minor, A7, D major 7. Same voice in. E minor, A7, D major 7. So you might think, how, how gives? How can that same chord be two different things? Well, because there's a lot of implication with these voicings, you don't have to play every note. So if this is a D major 7, that's the 5th, that's the 3rd, and that's the 7th. And there is no root, unless of course you want to play one of those double string jobs, like with, with the 2nd finger. In which case now it's a D major 7, so you could do it like this. Uh, e minor 7, and the same thing there. You could do double string finger with that one if you wanted to. A7. Or without that double finger thing, D major 7. So that could be D major 7. It could also be first inversion F sharp minor. Could be cut. Same voicing. So you see a lot of these three note voicings being played. Um, but what you've got to really, I think, do with these is you've got to learn like how context make, makes such a difference. So for example, that's a super common voicing. Sometimes you might even add. So that could be a half diminished chord. As well, so there's four, four um, ways of seeing that same chord. Okay, so we take a chord like this. Okay, so what's this, you know? Given the whatever answer you're gonna give, it's gonna be the wrong one. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, A minus six, is it? Maybe, could be a D9 as well. Or D7, sorry. Depends on the context. So a minor swing, you might go A minor. And a D minor. And an E7. Exact same voice in there. Exact same voice in for the E7. A minor, A minor, E7. A minor, A7 is the flat 9. D minor, just two voice ins there. Just two different shapes. So, Again, that could be A minor, it could be A diminished, it could be A minus 6, it could be D7, it could be an F7, with a flat 9, and, it, it, and on it goes, on it goes. So, what's a good idea with these chord voices? You think, okay, well, what, what do I do, you know? Well, first off, you put them into tunes, or you learn some of the moves. So, just to end today, because I'm aware the time is, 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 is there. Is marching on and I can look at this in greater depth or just expand upon these ideas in future weeks if you're interested. I'm going to give you two Gypsy Jazz moves based upon these voices, both of which I'll do in G. So the first one will be major, I'm going to go. Simple as that, yeah? simple as that. G6, D7, D7, 
listen to first impressions. They could argue. That's a D7. Flat nine. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's a D7 flat nine. Of course it is. Is that D7 over C? So G6, D7, D7 flat 9, G, first inversion. Okay, and then the minor version of this, of the same kind of thing, G minor, D7, G minor, first inversion. Now I'm going to go to C minor, G minor, D7, G minor. G7 flat 9, C minor. I'm going to use those two forms. So all I used there was this one and this one. But they ranged from being major chords, minor chords, dominant chords, dominant 7 flat 9s. Which is pretty much, or you can even put them as diminished chords, which as we know, you know, uh, there's two ways. In fact, here's a progression that's got both types of diminished chords. G, G sharp diminished, A minor, D7, G, G diminished, D7. So that's got a substitute diminished, G, G sharp diminished, it's an E7, A minor, D7, or C diminished, it's a substitute diminished, G, B flat diminished, that's a real diminished, that's actually the diminished chord in its true function. D7 or A minor. I did an extra chord there, sorry. So other than that one extra chord. Hopefully uh, making sense. Okay, right. I'm done with this hot room, hot and sweaty room, so I'm gonna go and have a beer, I think. I think I deserve it at a gig today. And I've been wrestling with this guitar, going in and out of tune due to the heat. I'm hoping I don't look too uh, dishevelled. Uh, thanks for sticking with me this far. I'm hoping that, uh, as always, that you've got something from this. Uh, any questions or anything you'd like me to look at in a bit more depth, then just holler and I'll do it. Uh, yeah, thanks once again for all the well wishes over the last few months. Uh, yeah, just to recap what I said at the head, you know, it, I've had amazing, immense news this week. But, uh, it looks like my lungs are all right, so touch wood. I've got no um, residual damage. I'm fine. I've got I've got away scot free. It looks like uh, I don't know how, but it looks like I have. So that's positive. So I'm going to stick around for a bit longer by the uh, by the looks of it. So keep the questions coming, and uh, I will see you next week. Uh, yeah, uh, please spread the word, spread the love. If you think anybody. Uh, if you can think of anybody that might appreciate looking at these things, then please let them know about it. You know, uh, of course, you know these things thrive on you know on numbers and whatever. And the more people that see this, the better, and it's good for me. You know, so it's hopefully good for for all of us. So take care of yourself. Uh, don't uh, don't work too hard on the guitar. Don't become too good. Uh, there's already enough pressure out there to get gigs. So so yeah, take it easy, and I will see you next time. Cheers.